on automating the credit process. So I know we've got a lot of people on the call today. Um, some of you probably have varying um, degrees of automation in your company. Some of you may still be in what we'll call an old school. You may still be taking credit applications in paper, using fax machines, things like that. Um, some of you may have already started the automation process. What we hope to accomplish today is to educate you on the many components that you are able to automate within the credit function, um, some ideas on how to do it, and certainly um, help you along in the process. So if you want to automate some or all of the credit process, uh, we're here to help and we're here to educate you. Technologies and innovation are set to dominate the future of the business world, but understanding those principles doesn't mean the top executives will know how to plan for the future. So with that, what we would like to do is help you and help your executives plan for the future of automation and the world to come in the 21st century as it applies to the modern day credit and collections department. So our agenda for today, um, we'll go over about eight different things. Um, the need for automation, do you need it? The essential areas in terms of what we believe are the most important parts of credit automation. How you can get started as a company. Um, even though, as Akshay said, um, Vernon will not be able to join us today, I'll go over some high-level credit scoring methodologies. We'll talk a little bit about electronic versus digital signatures, um, how you can now spend time on areas that will impact your business. And then Michelle is going to talk to us about integrating third-party credit reports, um, things you, from NACM and their NTCR reports. And then finally, I'm going to wrap up with how you can justify the cost of these processes to your senior management. So very quickly, before we get started, I just want everybody in their chat box, um, if you could, do you currently have an automation initiative or project in the works? And I'll give you a second to answer that. All right. So something to think about. Many, Like I said, many of you have joined the call because perhaps your executives have come to you and maybe you have um, a, a KPI or a goal that says you need to automate. Many of you have seen the need internally within your departments. You see what other people are doing. Perhaps you've attended professional association meetings and you understand that there's a need to automate. Or you just got an email from us and you're very curious what it means to automate the credit process. So are you okay with what you have today? Is your process working for you? There's many reasons that you should consider automating your credit department. Primarily, it's to make things better in one way or another or to address an executive requirement. So. This, this slide is very busy, but if you look at it and you see on your screen, you know, we have really transformed in the world of, the, of automation. In the first era, when we look at the 19th century, that was really the era of scientific discovery and invention. And more recently, you know, as, you come into, as we came into, well, not we, as our forefathers came into the 20th century, um, we began the digital revolution. We began having things, um, you know, utilizing computers, call centers, things like that, speeding up the processes. And then as we find ourselves now in the 21st century, we're faced with a global economy. We're letting machines help us to make better decisions as human beings. We, and now we're at a point where we've got better thinking machines, and we're utilizing them to help us make better decisions, and to perform analysis on the work that we're doing. It's time for everyone to enter the 21st century. So do you need automation? You know, financial organizations have been asked to do a lot more with less. They've been asked to improve productivity, and they've been asked to make things faster and better and have a better customer experience. So when you ask yourself, do I need to automate my department? 
Perhaps many of you have been asked to do more with less. As, as managers and staff members, you may have been asked to either cut costs, cut employees, or your business is growing significantly and they're not willing to give you headcount. How, how are you going to address that? Perhaps somebody has given you a goal of automation. I know certainly in the years when I was working for companies, you know, leading the credit departments, every year we had to sit down and look at our goals. And oftentimes the CFO would come to me and say, you, you need a, an IT goal. It can't just be collecting more money, collecting money faster, making customers happy, training your, training your staff. Automation is a great goal and it benefits the entire company. As credit and collections professionals, you might also see that you have unhappy customers. We're certainly the first line of defense when it comes to knowing whether or not we have an unhappy customer. So automation can help improve the customer experience. It might either give them less touch points with directly with people. It will speed up things like onboarding. Um, it will help you to be proactive so that perhaps your calls with customers are, are not so negative. Things are more talking about how you can better be a business partner. Are you seeing that you might have complaints from your salespeople? Historically, sales and credit have, have been, had an on time, at times, an adversarial role. Are you seeing a lot of complaints from your salespeople? Are they coming to you saying the customers are complaining about the new, the new experience when they join your company? Or they perhaps they want to buy more product and it's taking too long to increase the credit limit. All these things, you can lose customers and you can, it can be a detriment to your relationship as a professional with your salespeople. Are you losing paperwork? We all have seen these large filing cabinets in our offices. There's credit files, and there's sales orders, and there's paperwork from customers. Wouldn't it be better to have a place to store it and be able to pull it up automa automatically? All these things are questions you should ask yourself when you ask yourself, do we need automation? So when looking at whether or not you want to automate, we believe that there are 10 important areas to examine when thinking about the credit automation process. We like to say that our goal is to become more agile, automated, and adaptive. And we look at really, as I said, these 10 different areas. We look at online applications. We'll talk about the areas of digital signatures, reference checks. People still do reference checks, but many of you are still doing them old school. We look at integrating with the external credit agencies. Credit scoring. Credit scoring, and I'll probably say this several times throughout the presentation, it's one of the areas where you get the most bang for your buck in terms of automation. Rules-based credit limit granting. We'll look at workflow, periodic analysis, analytics and dashboards, and, and doc, digital document storage. So the first area that we're going to talk about in terms of automating, and this is probably the easiest and least expensive way. If there's one area you're going to look at perhaps automating, it's the online credit application form. The online credit application form is, is a great tool to have. You can go online. You can set up a form. You can load in, for example, um, we have a tool it's, it's on a website called thecreditapplication.com. It's actually a free tool that we allow to people. Um, you can go in. You can set up the template for your credit application. You can download your company's logo. You send a link to your customer. And they can go in and fill in the forms online. There's spots on these forms. There's free form fields where you can put in terms and conditions that they have to accept. There's waivers. You can do things um, like get the information for UCC1 filings um, and purchase money security interest. All these things allow you a self-service process 
They allow you to reduce time. And of course, they lower the costs associated with lost paperwork. I don't know how many of you are still using fax machines, but I, I'd like to think that the fax machine is a dying breed. I know at the last company that I worked at as, as director of accounts receivable, I used to sit, my office was right by the fax machine. And that, and I never saw so many people coming by with jammed up paper. It was constantly broken. Paperwork was constantly being lost. This allows your customers to submit via email, they submit a form online, and somebody, some designee of your choice in a company receives the application online. Simplest and easiest way to begin the online automation process. Start with the credit application. So within these credit applications, one of the really great things that we have today at our access are electronic and digital signatures. I'm going to go into a little bit more detail in, in a later section, but electronic and digital signatures um, are great. They're convenient. They allow your customer to sign and accept the terms and conditions of your credit application. They allow them to agree to the fact, you know, of having their references checked. Um, there's, you know, we now have the Electronic Transaction Act, which was legislation, especially in the U.S., but in many other countries, that make these a legal document. They allow you to also increase the authenticity so that you know who's been signing these credit applications. You no longer, again, it's going to reduce the paperwork, and it's going to certainly decrease the amount of lost paperwork. One of the greatest areas that I find where you can make an improvement as well is in digital reference checks. It's a pretty simple automation process. You can automate the reference checks with an email-based web form. Again, most of us still like to get trade references. We still like to see a bank reference. But no one wants to make those phone calls anymore. It takes staffing. It takes time. And again, a lot of times people don't want to talk to you. If you can, using digital reference checks, there is an automated process that will send the, rest, the references out to the various trades and banks. They'll be able to send them back in an automated fashion. And you'll be able to spend more time on things that really impact the vision, the business rather. And again, you know, I, I can't speak enough about how archaic the fax machine is, I'm assuming many of your offices probably don't even have fax machines anymore. So something to consider certainly is the digital reference check. Integrating with external credit reports. This is especially useful for credit scoring. You can now pull information in an automated fashion from Companies like Dun & Bradstreet, Experian, Equifax, places like NACM, their NTCR, Yahoo Finance. You can get fast and quick access to third-party credit reporting. You can store the information, and you can integrate it into a single report that you can use as the basis for your credit scoring. You can use it as the basis if you want to do ratio calculations, many of us use ratios in our credit scoring process or determine you might use the quick ratios. Um, I know way back when we used to assign credit limits as 10% of the working capital of a business. You can make all that automated. You can pull something, for example, publicly traded company. You can pull the financials from Yahoo Finance. It can do the calculation for you and you can have an automated um, credit limit number assigned or a suggested number assigned to it. Um, so it's, it's very useful to get everything in one spot. It also allows you to pull vast amounts of data in a very quick amount of time. One of the things that you're going to find with automating or attempting to automate your credit process is that you're going to find tremendous time savings. And you're going to find it in places you never thought or never really considered that you were spending time on. It's also going to increase your efficiency because you're pulling more data. 
as we all know, making an a informed credit decision doesn't mean just getting information from a single source. We now, in, with the automation process, have a world of information that you can pull from. And certainly the reporting agencies that I've listed on here are not inclusive of what you can do uh, when pulling information from third-party sources. Credit scores. Um, again, and I said this early in the presentation, and I'm going to probably say it again, credit scoring is where you're going to get the most bang for your buck, and I think it's going to allow you to use automation probably to its fullest. Um, I'm going to discuss it again a little bit. I'm going to discuss the different methodologies a, later, a little bit later on. But one of the great things, or, or several of the great things about credit scoring is they allow you to sort of fine-tune the things in your organization that you believe are important and that you need to look at and, and create a scorecard that will tell you whether, for example, a customer may be a high, medium, or low-risk customer, you might utilize them to tell you how much credit to assign. You can do these by division, which is a really great thing. You can, you can break it down by the components of your business. Many of you have multiple business units or multiple business lines that you're selling to. You don't want to make the same credit decision for, say, low volume, high dollar customers as you may make for high volume, low dollar customers. So you can change the scoring. You can adjust it by division. You can set up your credit policies based on these decisions. It allows you to do it, certainly um, many of you have global businesses. Today is a world of global business. You might, you can set up scores. I know I recently, prior to coming to Amina, I had a consulting assignment where I was setting up some scoring for a company. And we set up the scoring based upon the country um, where our customers were in. Certain countries, um, for this business, we found that countries like China and certain Latin American countries were certainly higher risk. So we set dollar thresholds and things like that for lower in the scoring process. We, we changed the scoring to fit the region or country that it was in. All of these things can be adjusted with a scorecard. And one of the also, you know, one of the really great things that you'll find, not just with credit scoring, but also with this whole automation process, is it allows you to be SOX 404 and regulatory compliant on policies and procedures. Um, a lot of, with the automation, you get checkpoints, you get the ability to validate information, you have documented time stamping and things like this. So these things are going to make your internal audit and your external auditors very happy because now you've got a repeatable process and you've got checkpoints and control points where you can look at how you're assigning your credit limits. So when I get to the latter part of the presentation and we start talking about ROI and justifying costs and things like that, um, you might want to make note of the fact that one of your biggest arguments, aside from cost savings, is going to be the ability to be 404 and regulatory compliant. Along the same lines, you know, of, of scoring is rules-based credit decisions. You can set rules that, that really automate the process. You can configure these rules so that you can bring customers on board much more quickly. For example, you have a customer that your scoring determines is a lower risk customer. If somebody falls into the, a low risk bucket, and perhaps you might set a threshold, say they only want a credit limit of $10,000 or less. Any customer that becomes low risk in less than $10,000 may automatically get assigned a credit limit go through your decisioning process and automatically get onboarded. You can also do things where high-risk customers or high-touch customers, they might get routed to a certain person. You might have a, a credit person on your staff who only handles high-risk customers. 
they might be somebody who is specially trained to do in-depth financial analysis or something like that. So you have these rules. You can put rules into an automated system that allow you to make these credit decisions more quickly. And then you're really only touching the customers that you need to do. Again, in terms of cost savings, and I don't advocate this with none of us want to ever reduce staff. Unfortunately, many of us are tasked with that at some point in our careers. And if you do happen to be tasked with reducing staff or doing more with less, again, by automating these decisions, especially for the low-risk customers and bringing them on board quickly, not only are you improving the time to revenue to bring, you know, sales and money into the business, you're doing more with less. And that's certainly what all of our management is asking us to do with at any one time. Along the same lines, workflow-based credit approvals. They really, really help to streamline the process. So, for example, you've got a customer. You bring them on board. They go through the scoring. They go through the, the decisioning. And now it's got to be approved. I don't, I can't tell you how many companies that I worked for where I had to send, you know, I would have a credit analyst on my team approve or make a recommendation on a credit application. I'd get it and it would say, you know, approved for $50,000. Then they would email me their approval and bring a credit file into my office. And then I would review the file and then I would approve it. But for whatever limit, then I had to bring it into the CFO's office. And I'd be carrying around these files, and I'd be getting email approvals. Well, that, that is the way of yesterday. You, you no longer need to do that. Systems now have workflow-based approvals. You can set up these approvals either based on an HR hierarchy. You can set them up in your company. Sometimes sales has to approve a credit limit. Sometimes it's the CFO. It really varies by company. You set up the approval process, and then you also set up a process if things have to be rejected or kicked back for more information. You need to escalate information. And you, automating the, the approval process, again, an incredibly efficient time saver. And once again, SOX 404 and regulatory compliant. With these workflow approvals, um, I know certainly in the Imaja system and many of our competitor systems, they all have time stamps, date stamps, all the things that you may need to provide to your auditors to pr prove that credit has been approved through the normal channels. I mean, I, I, I'll tell you, I would have loved to have had something like this. I found myself in, in a situation many years ago where a rogue person approved a gigantic credit limit. And it took us a very long time to figure out how it got through the system. If we had had this time and date stamp, if we had had these workflow approvals, we would have at least known how it had happened and probably could have stopped the order from actually shipping out the door. So really great for risk management, really great for regulatory compliance as well. So how often do you review your customers? Um, some customers you may have scheduled to review once a year, some on a quarterly basis. It really varies by company. Automation allows you to set up periodic portfolio reviews. So in terms of credit approvals, this is no longer just about bringing on new customers. It's also about reviewing the customers that you have. It allows you, at whatever interval that you choose, pre-scheduled reviews, you can review the portfolio, you can monitor your existing customers, and you can see, you know, in cases where you've got automated approval, again, going back a few slides, where you automate the process, you know, low-risk customers may automatically get approved, you can automate, you know, you can automate the renewal process. You can also use this for certain reporting to drive revenue. Do you have, you get a report of those customers 
that have not utilized their, their credit limit to their fullest. You may have a customer with a $100,000 credit limit that's only purchased $50,000 worth of product. They may be completely current. And you can use this to generate an automated review. And then you can work with sales to build business with this specific customer. Or conversely, if you've got customers that are bumping up against their credit limit and their past due, you can use it to manage and, and maintain, you know, credit risk. And hopefully, you know, in the long run, this will help you to reduce your, your bad debt reserves. Dashboards reporting business intelligence and predictive analytics. Um, probably one of the newest and most useful tools in the automation process. Um, these analytics and dashboards are really great. You can report on your customers. You can get alerts. You can see exposures by customers. You can use these to share reports with your executives. One of the great things about these um, dashboards and analytics is they allow you to have several different views into your credit, you know, into your customer's credit exposure. Um, they allow you prescriptive views. So they will tell you it's not just a reporting. They are looking at historic data and trends, and they're giving you a prescriptive view. In other words, they're showing you what you should do with these customers. Is this a good customer? Should you proactively be calling the customer? How should you manage this customer? And you're able to share this not just with your credit analyst. You can share it with sales. You can share it with executives. They allow you, you know, the one part that you also need, which is the basic reporting on your credit. It gives you a descriptive view. What are your customers doing today? It allows you to slice and dice in a graphic depiction credit limit utilization, credit limit underutilization. How, what, how fast are your credit limits being set? How quickly are you onboarding customers? You can use it to provide sales with the reports. How much of the credit limit are they using? Any, you can set up dashboards and reporting basically on any aspect of your credit limits, credit exposure. They also give you predictive outcomes. They allow you to determine you, with complex machine learning and analysis who your risky customers may be. Dashboards and analytics now allow you to do cash flow forecasting. So who's going to pay and when are they going to pay? And it also allows you to track payment behavior. Um, there are so many things I can talk to you about, about dashboards and analytics, and, and really that, that being my current forte. I'm not going to go into too much of that. If you have any interest, you know, see me at a separate time. But since we're, we're, we're really talking about automating the credit process today, I, I, I'm not going to go into too much more detail. The last component of the automation is digital document storage. I don't know how many of you still have rows and rows of filing cabinets in your office. You may have some, you may have the credit application. Legal may have the customer's contract. Sales may have the quoting document. Order management might have purchase orders. There is now digital document storage that can be pulled up in an automated fashion so that you can get all your documentation and see it in one place. You can store customer financial data. Um, you can use it to store things, um, anybody that has reseller certificates and things like that. You no longer need to be using these big metal filing cabinets. Um, you can access things. Um, you can use, like, big data storage, and they have ways of pulling up documents similar to a Google search. Um, you know, there's you know, SharePoint and things like that for much smaller versions of document storage. But you have access to all of these things in this day. So all of these 10 areas are going to help you to bring your credit department into the 21st century. Excuse me. They're going to help you to become a thought leader and be proactive in your organization. 
they will help you in terms of improving efficiency on all levels. They're going to help you onboard customers faster. They're going to help you store documents in a better way. They will help you be, you know, be proactive, improve your relationships with the sales department, and of course drive the growth of your company. So, at, you know, at, again, as we like to say, all of this will help you become more agile, automated, and adaptive. So very quickly, I'm going to, with, since Vernon is not here, I'm going to go over credit scoring methodologies a little bit and talk to you a little bit about that. Certainly, um, while I, I do know a considerable amount about it, it's not my, my core expertise as it is Vernon's. But So the benefits of credit scoring, why do I need to score? You know, why do I need to use um, credit scoring? Why... How am I going to get the most bang for my buck with this? So what are you getting from scoring? You're certainly getting speed and accuracy. You're reducing, you know, your your losses. It helps you to reduce staffing. Um, credit scoring helps you prioritize the activities in your group and make decisions. As I said earlier, you're utilizing complex scoring from various locations to determine things like whether or not a customer is a high, medium, or low risk, to determine the amounts of limits. You may be utilizing it to determine how often you need to check a customer. They're really the best decision-making tools that you can get as a credit professional, and they allow you to be consistent in your decisions. They allow you to look at various parts of your business and be consistent throughout the business. And as I've said, and we'll probably repeat many times again, they allow you to be SOX and regulatory compliant. So there are really two different types of credit scoring models. You know, there are many others that are sort of a combination of them. But I'm gonna, I'll quickly talk to the really the two types of scoring models that you should consider when you look at automating your credit approval process. The first um, being the judgmental type scoring model. And that really gets ratios pulled from history that you of the data that you can pull. So you're getting information from banks, payments, trade references, things like that. You might be pulling financial statement ratios. They're based on your experience with your customers how they how they pay in certain industries. You're pulling third-party data to get really trade experiences on your customers. It's very straightforward. The rules are easily set. You're, like I said, you're pulling information from either third parties or historic knowledge that you've, you've already got. The second type of scoring model is the one that we talk about more. It's the one that we really call a scorecard. It's the one that Certainly at, here at Amaja, we use because we find it to be more beneficial. It's really been a proven risk-reducing model. And it allows you to use statistical math methods ra rather than people's current judgment and experience. We use credit agencies and files. We pull various sources from, you know, at one time. It could be a third-party credit reporting agency. It could be a ratio from a financial scorecard. And then we assign weights to each of these things. You may make 50% of your decision based upon how this customer pays other vendors. You might take 10% of your decision based upon a range of working capital. You, you put all these together and you set up a scorecard. And you utilize that scorecard to make a determination, again, of how much limit and how risky you're going to consider this customer. And again, you can adopt a blended method of both of these. I know certainly when we set up scoring models with our customers, um, we, we look at what their needs are, what's important to your executive, what are the key factors that you've been using over the years to determine your credit. Automating the process does not necessarily mean changing the current system that you have. 
if you're a system of assigning credit limits has worked for you in the past, and you just want to speed it up, we can create scoring models that, that fit in with that. Conversely, it's also a good time to assess what you've got, and if you find that you have a high rate of, of bad debt, or you have a lot of risky customers, then it's the time to look at what things should I be looking at and certainly talk about how you want to set up a model. But the great part about automating it, as opposed to what you're doing now, which may be three trades in a bank reference, is you can pull in from a myriad of sources. You know, the amount of sources you can pull from are almost endless to make these decisions. You don't want to pull from too many sources. You don't want to muddy the water. But again, you want to decide what's important to your business, set up what a scorecard, assign the weights to that, and then make your automated decisions based upon that. So should you use, you know, should I use a credit scoring model? Who should be using these things? Certainly, the best candidate for a credit scoring model is somebody that has a lot of high volume, low dollar transactions. You set up the model, it easily approves or rejects a credit limit, it goes through an automated workflow, customer gets notified, you onboard the customer, no one has to touch it. That's really, that, that's where you clearly get the most value for your dollar in terms of an automation process. You should use these, if, you know, very simply put, you have a need for speed, accuracy, and consistency. Do you want decisions to be made in the same way across your organization? Do you want to remove, you know, some of the human judgment, speed it up, bring customers on board faster? While it's really great for the high volume, low dollar customers, it's also really great if you have a few customers with high dollars and you just want to manage the exceptions. You can also use these to communicate risk to management, banks, or auditors. You might have um, loan covenants that are AR based and you might have to report to your bank about risky customers. If you can show them that you're using a model, and this is how you're bringing on board customers, you may be able to help your co company increase its borrowing base. And certainly, it's really, in my opinion, the only effective tool to quantify risk. Quickly, I'm going to go through electronic versus digital signatures. Again, we talked about using, you know, about using them in terms of the credit application. They're really a great way now to validate who's been signing them. Um, all of the laws that were passed in around 2000 that allow and enforce electronic signatures make them a very viable tool to use. This way you don't have to, even if you have an electronic, you know, many of the companies allow you to automate the credit application process. You can get sent a credit application, but then you have to send it back to the customer to get a signature. These really speed up these processes. They minimize the security risk. Nowadays, you can get very secure signatures, especially with digital signatures. An electronic signature, just to, to tell you a little bit about the difference, electronic signature is something like there might be a box on the train and you input initials, and it's not, it doesn't validate somebody's exact signature. A digital signature actually allows somebody with their finger to go on the screen and actually sign it, and it's, all, it's got more advanced technology and two-way feedback. Um, again, just like credit scoring and analytics, I can do a whole webinar on, on digital signatures. We don't have that kind of time today. Um, Again, if you want to learn more about electronic versus digital signatures, I can I can share that with you at another time. But certainly, they're growing in usage. Um, the U.S., the EU, India, Brazil, just to name a few countries, have adopted the legality of these signatures. They are holding up in court, so they're really great to be using. So how do how do I get started? All of everything that I've gone through sounds great. I've gone through it rather quickly. Automation is a wonderful thing. How do I begin? The first thing you need to do is assess your current state. What do you have? 
Am I currently in the dark ages or am I somewhere in between? Figure out where you are today. Look at your current ERP system. Are you on a big system like an SAP or an Oracle? Do you have disparate? Do you have legacy systems, SAP, Oracle, and a whole bunch of spreadsheets? Do I need to be able to consolidate from a variety of locations? What do I need? Do I have multiple locations? Who needs to be able to use the system? You need to establish an end goal. Where do you want to be? You need to get executive buy-in. At the very end, after Michelle talks, I'm going to tell you a little bit about establishing an ROI. You need to get the executives on your side, and you need to prove it. Not just the executives, but you need to make sure you've got IT support. When you start talking to third-party companies such as ours or any of the other competitors, do you, are you going to get IT support? How much IT support? Our system does, we sort of act as the IT department, so we require minimal IT support. Some systems require more, some require less. Are you going to get their time and effort? Cost and ROI, you're going to need to justify these. And then finally, you're going to need to establish a timeline. You need to know how long you're going to, it's going to take to set it up and how long do you have. If you have a goal, how much time? How much of IT time are you going to have? And then once you've done all this, you're going to have the ability to spend time on things that, that really impact the, the business. You can use your time. You know, I've only listed a few things here. But if, you're, if you've automated many of your processes, you don't have to spend time on the lower touch customers. You can spend time evaluating credit lines and being proactive, working with sales to drive business. You can spend time on training staff, staff, becoming an operational leader within the business. I know I can't tell you how many times over the course of the years I was asked to work on projects. I'm sure everyone on this phone has been asked to work on a project. Now you might have time to work on projects. Future autom automation process projects. You can work on process improvement. You'll have time to work with people in order management and sales on how to better onboard your customers. You can work on all the kind of things that are going to impact your business and give you more time. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Michelle Herman, who is going to talk to you a little bit about our credit reports. NACM and NTCR credit reporting. Give me one second to transfer it to Michelle. And it's...
Thanks, Michelle. Um, as Michelle said, I know we are running short on time. I'm just going to spend one second talking about justifying costs um, because an ROI is so important. Um, if you have to jump off the call, I understand. Um, we'll send out an email in the next day or so so you'll have mine and Michelle's contact information if you can't stay. Otherwise, um, I'm going to wrap up by talking about um, the importance of spending time on an ROI. So, you know, whether you have an initiative from an executive or you've been on the phone, you know, on the webinar today and just said, wow, I need to automate. I may not be able to do everything, but I want to do some of it. Really spend time to show that the costs are justified by business gains. Um, certainly, any company that you go to, whether it's an Amaja or one of our competitors, we would sit down with you and um, help you justify the ROI. When you go to your executives, be able to show not just dollar savings, but savings from the new capabilities, whether it's time or people. Come in there armed with data. Also, talk to the, you know, the non-tangibles like customer satisfaction and sales growth. Be prepared when you go to talk to your executives with options, examples, and also success stories to your peers. Any vendor will be able to give you examples. Show them how a similar company has done, you know, done similar things. So if you're going to talk to your CFO, your controller, your treasurer, any of your management, come in with an armful of data. Show them how automation is going to benefit your company. And I think you're going to get a much better reception instead of, hey, we need to automate the credit process. If you can show them how they'll save dollars and time, time you can do more with less. You can show them statistics maybe on how your customers have been unhappy and how you can improve that. All of that is going to help you. And then it's going to give you time, once you set up these automation processes, to spend more time on things that really benefit the organization, that make you a thought leader in the organization, and certainly build time with your executives. So with that, um, I know time is up, so I don't want to keep anybody. I will stay on the line for about five more minutes. Michelle and I will be here. If you have any questions, please go into your chat box and send them. If not, thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you learned about the benefits of automation. Again, we'll send out an email in the next day or so. If you don't have um, Michelle and my contact information and we would be happy to either set up private demos or discuss anything further with you. So with that, I will give it a second for any questions. I just got a question um, from somebody on the line that said, is it better, best to implement in parts or to do, you know, all ten things at once? Well, that really, you know, in, in my opinion, that really depends on your customer and on your company, I mean, excuse me, on your company. Um, what kind of budget do you have? Certainly doing it in piecemeal is not a bad thing. Maybe you want to first automate the credit application process. Maybe you just want to bring customers on board faster. And then the next step, you want all the reporting and the, the analytics and the credit scoring. Um, certainly we do, um, we, we do implementations of all types. Again, it really depends on cost, time, and, and the goals of your business. Um, I did just get another question. It's not a technical question, but one of, one of the folks has asked if we can email the presentation. We will certainly PDF a presentation to the people. Also, if you go to www.amaja.com, uh, we have recorded this um, presentation. And it, it may take a day or two to get loaded up there, but you will find it um, on our website, and you can listen to it again and see it again and certainly print it from there. Um, I don't see any other questions at this point. So with that, I'm going to wrap it up. Again, thank you so much. Again, feel free. Um, as Michelle said, we're both available on LinkedIn. We're both available either at the NACM or the Imaja website. 
Um, we will send out an email after this um, that will have both our contact information. So um, thanks for joining us, and have a great day. Bye-bye.